Uh, my name is uh, Marty Weaver. I'm a retired gunner's mate technician chief from, and a Vietnam veteran. My name's Everett Dane Jr. I'm a U.S. Army re uh, retired veteran. I'm with uh, in transportation in uh, Vietnam. Uh, we're here today for our annual uh, Lincoln County High School celebration of the veterans. We have our ROTC escorting us, and we're going to give a little talk and uh, lecture about uh, our service in Vietnam and the other wars. Uh, it's just a nice get together and a little luncheon afterwards. It means quite a bit to the veterans and stuff uh, to tell them about their experience, uh, been able to reach out to the young people and stuff, you know, it, and, and it helps a lot of the veterans to uh, see that a lot of people and kids are interested in our, the past or what uh, we've been into. Well, we just a, more or less a reminder that the veterans have served and those that have, have survived and those that have died, without this, uh, they'd be forgotten. This is like a testimonial to the veterans and we really appreciate all the effort they put forth and we love them for it. Well, I'm Bill Lambert, uh, the state commander for the veterans of Ford Moores for the state of West Virginia. And uh, I had 22, over 22 years in service in the Air Force and uh, I flew out of Charleston for 14 years. Well, we were invited to come down and um, see the ROTC and uh, we uh, are going to commit to some financial funds to help them here uh, if, if we can. Well it brings a lot of discipline, uh, responsibility and uh, I think that's what our country sorely needs right now. Veterans are a proud uh, group and uh, very patriotic and any time they can support our youth, they're more than happy to do it. The VFW is the uh, uh, largest combat veteran organization in the world, and uh, we are continuously uh, looking for members uh, to build, and uh, the more members we have, the more influence we have with the politicians in Washington. My name is uh, Kevin Light. I'm the state adjutant quartermaster for the VFW state of West Virginia. I served uh, 26 years in the U.S. Navy from 1979 to 2005. I greatly appreciate this opportunity to come and uh, for uh, educational programs to rec recognize America's heroes because the veterans are definitely America's heroes. What we did uh, to preserve the freedom uh, and give everybody the opportunity, opportunity to do what they can today on their own is all based solely on uh, veterans' uh, uh, initiatives and accomplishments. Uh, my name is Dallas Plumley. I'm a retired lieutenant colonel, and I teach JRTC here at the high school. I'm the senior army instructor. And this is my uh, eighth year teaching here at the, at the high school. What we do is to try to teach the kids about Veterans Day is one of the tasks that I have them do is in October, they had to find a veteran and do an interview with them. Work a little bit on their English skills and do some thinking about what type of questions to ask and then how to present this in a paper format to a teacher. And I worked with another English teacher here where she was helping with them to the proper format and those types of things. So they did an interview back in October. Now, this, this for today, to celebrate here in the county, we, in, we do a Veterans Day celebration for all the folks in the county and everyone's invited. And the kids are required to bring a veteran to this event or they get to write another essay. I think it means that they're being recognized. A lot of veterans, if they were during the Vietnam era, early 80s, were never recognized publicly. Uh, that really only started after 2003 when the, the towers were attacked and we were attacked. And that's when recognition started in public for soldiers. I spent 20 years in and really wasn't recognized until the last three or four years. Uh, in, in the public by people that just saw me in uniform. And what this does is it makes the kids recognize that they have veterans among them that are all over the place. And uh, they're just normal people. They went and did their time or they did 20 years. 
and they have the, have the opportunity to hear some stories. Some of the cadets, when they did interviews, learned stuff about folks they had no idea about, which was, uh, and it's all about education and appreciating what you have out there. One of the things I think people need to recognize is that the veterans did a lot. We're in a, we're a place in time now where our World War II veterans are dying off rapidly. Our Korean veterans will happen in the next five to 10 years. And there's a, there are a wealth of information, wealth of knowledge that are in those people with experiences that really uh, people can learn by. I mean, bits of wisdom that kids can pick up if they listen to their elders uh, about why you shouldn't do stupid stuff when you're 15 years old, because it'll follow you the rest of your life. Uh, and I think it's just that there are wealth of knowledge that can be taken advantage of and learned from if the kids will stop and listen. The JRTC program is designed to motivate kids to, go, to be better citizens. And for, and for every person, there's different levels of being a better citizen. Uh, our goal here at Lincoln High, High School is to support the school in all its endeavors and to get these kids to graduation, because that's what we want. We want kids to graduate and be productive citizens and do what they want to do in life. Uh, and whether they're in my program back here in my class or we see them here in the commons area, the goal was to help these kids make good decisions and start thinking about their future. Uh, yeah, they may be 16 years old, but they're two years away from graduating and being an adult. And the things they do now are building blocks for what they're able to do when they're 20 years old. And if they don't get a good foundation, they're going to be struggling their life. So I think JRTC gives those kids that are not into a certain type of thing in school another opportunity to involve, be involved in something. And we keep the kids busy all year as long as, as we keep them as busy as they can stand. At this time, we will begin the ceremony with the presentation of colors by the JRTC and singing by the band. Sorry, Major, post the colors. Right, fix, carry colors. Four, march. March time, march.
Cadet Angel, can you please come forward, please? If you all would please stand and um, come with me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Again, I would like to thank everyone for coming out today. Uh, we appreciate it. I know my cadets will appreciate it, especially those that found a veteran because uh, they were looking at writing an essay if they didn't. So they appreciate your attendance. Uh, at this time, I would like to, is Mr. Schneider in the room? Yeah, please. Uh, Yes. yes. Uh, support. Okay. And uh, all right. That's what we're worried about, Mr. Schneider. Getting here. Mr. Schneider and uh, Mr. Barker, who is a delegate for Lincoln County and Boone, Boone, Logan, and Putman. Okay. This is my third assembly today, so and I got four on Friday. I'm uh, a little tired, and uh, I went full circle today. First of all, I want to thank my uh, cousin, Lauren Short, uh, for having me. Uh, her company was uh, one of the ones that sponsored the uh, Bring a Veteran to School. I just want to say something real quick. I am one guy that is very proud to live in the state of West Virginia that still believes in prayer in the schools. When I go to a ball game on Friday nights, we still pray at football games. I, I believe in that, and I'm very proud of the fact that we get to do that still. And it's you guys, you veterans, is the reason why we still get to do that. And I just want to stand up here and thank you from the bottom of my heart. I get to walk, I live on a farm in Boone County. And I take my three-year-old daughter out there, and uh, we was pip picking plums back in August. And it was a fairly nice day. But my grandfather crossed my mind, and that happens from time to time. But he was an MP at Panama. And he went and fought in World War II. And because of people like him, is because I can stand up here in a free state and country and be able to present two flags to the principal of Lincoln County High School on behalf of the state legislature. Thank you guys for having me, and I look forward to coming back next year. One of the things we started doing a couple years ago here at Lincoln County High School, we started partnering with Armstrong and with Take a Veteran to School. And what's really good about that is that you're able to hear stories and events and happenings of people that have served in the military, some as far back as World War II or currently even in Afghanistan, Iraq. And you can hear from a first person point of view on what they saw, did, or how they acted, or what the things they got from it. So what, I, what we have today is five gentlemen here to tell their story. What I'm gonna do is ask them to, to go to the table up front. They're gonna introduce themselves. And then after they've spoke for five or 10 minutes each, we're gonna open it up for questions. So if you have questions that you, that you wanna ask at the, end of the, at the end of this little event, We'll go around, we'll ask those questions if they haven't answered something, or if you got a, a bit of information you want to get more of. And as well, afterwards, we'll, we'll be outside where the hospice has uh, snacks for us, where you can also ask them questions there if we don't get them all answered in here. So at this time, gentlemen, if you can, please join the front table. I'm Major General Retired Alan Tackett. Uh, I served 48 years in the West Virginia National Guard culminating with 15 and a half years as the Adjutant General of the State of West Virginia. 
It's five and a half years longer than anybody else in the history of the state. In the last 10 years, we were in war, and I was responsible for preparing nearly 7,000 men and women in both the Army and the Air National Guard to go fight in our nation's wars. Uh, I want to start on the right and allow Sergeant Major Harry and, and then the other panelists to uh, talk a little bit about themselves and introduce themselves. If you would, <coughs> Sergeant Major. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Kevin Harry. I'm a Command Sergeant Major, uh, Senior Enlisted Leader for the West Virginia National Guard. Uh, I advise the Adjutant General, uh, currently Major General James A. Hoyer, on the health and welfare of the over 6,500 soldiers and airmen of West Virginia in, in both the Army and the air side. Uh, two air wings, a C-5 and a C-130 wing, and uh, two brigade size elements with uh, forces ranging from special forces, engineers, MPs, field artillery, and uh, armored reconnaissance squadrons. Um, I've been in this position for about eight months. Um, started out in a small town in Johnson County, uh, Tennessee. Uh, much like some of the students here today, didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, had the options of looking, or looking at college. Um, chose the military. Uh, pursued a uh, career in the military and about the 11th year in the military, actually about the 10th year in the military, met with some soldiers from West Virginia in uh, a small town in Haiti um, as we were uh, in Operation Uphold Democracy. And uh, they told me about the organization here and some of the opportunities that would be available as far as uh, continuing my education, which was important to me at that point in my life. I uh, joined into the West Virginia National Guard, uh, took advantage of some of the programs that General Tackett was instrumental in and allowing current serving soldiers and airmen in the West Virginia National Guard 100% state tuition reimbursement uh, to attend college. Um, fast forward a few years, a uh, couple deployments into Afghanistan. Uh, again, I'm the senior enlisted leader with not only a undergraduate, uh, a bachelor's degree from uh, East Tennessee State University, a master's degree from Mountain State University here in West Virginia. And those opportunities were, you know, largely in part because of the military, but just uh, more specifically, the opportunities that the West Virginia National Guard has, uh, has afforded me. So um, pleased to be here and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Kevin. My name's Ray Hatfield and I'm a, a product of the uh, draft system into the United States Army. Uh, I hope that's something that you all will never have to face and I hope our country never gets in that type of a war again that we'll have to draft. But anyway, I was drafted in 1966. Uh, not that I was averse to the military to wait to be drafted, but uh, I, I had a good job at the time, and I thought, uh, uh, as I had planned when I graduated from high school, was to enlist in the Air Force. But this job came along, and I was uh, satisfied with it, so I just waited for my draft notice then. Uh, this was 1966. I went to basic training at uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, and after uh, basic training. I went to AIT at uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And my MOS, uh, your military occupation, was an 82 Charlie 20, which was an artillery survey specialist. And after uh, graduation from the uh, AIT school, I went to Fort Hood, Texas for one year to the day. And as a draftee, I had a two-year obligation. So after AIT, the uh, <coughs> comrades that I was in class with, uh, most of them went straight to Vietnam. But I didn't. I went to Fort Hood, Texas, and they told me, well, we'll be getting off the plane coming back as you're going over. And I said, well, no way. But never say no way. <laughs> And in fact, a year to the day, that's what the uh, uh, term of deployment to Vietnam was at the time, 12 months. 12 months to the day, I was getting on a plane going to Vietnam while they were coming back 
although I didn't meet any one of them, but it, it still rang true in my head uh, what they said. Uh, anyway, I got to Vietnam, and since my uh, MOS was a survey specialist, and I was part of the 198th Light Infantry Brigade that was made up of Fort Sill, Oklahoma, uh, Fort Hood, Texas, and sent to Vietnam. Uh, my duties were to place the guns and give them an asthma to fire, and also to identify targets and give coordinates so that the artillery could fire on these uh, targets. But since my brigade taken the place of the 196th Light Infantry Brigade, uh, there was nothing for a surveyor to do. Our, we set our guns down in the, the same tire tracks that the uh, guns that left. So I ran one survey the whole time I was there in Vietnam, and that was a defensive target over top of the replacement company's uh, commanding officer's uh, bunker. He wanted a what we called a Victor Tango. It was a, a round that exploded 50 meters above the ground and shot shrapnel down. This was only in case the compound had been overrun. That was the last resort it was to shoot the Victor Tango. Well, uh, to continue, since there wasn't any survey work for me to do, I was loaned out to the American advisors to the Vietnamese. And I worked with three different uh, MACV, we called them, MACV teams. And the first one was at Ben Son. That's in I Corps, uh, right south of Chu Lai, which was a Marine air base. And that was my unit's main duty was to provide protection for the Marine air base. And while at Ben Son, that was my only uh, combat that I was in. Our uh, compound got overrun. There was 12 of us, and we got overrun by 600 plus Viet Cong. And we lost uh, two of our team members, and it, we probably would have been captured or killed if it hadn't been for three helicopter gunships that came to our rescue and they circled our compound uh, all night from about two o'clock in the morning until daylight because at daylight that's when the Vietcong broke off. They did their fighting at night when the surprise and was at their, to their advantage. Well anyway uh, as the ammunition grew uh, low on one ship, it would break off and go back to base and get rearmed and come in. Another ship would uh, take off and go get fuel and, and ammunition. Anyway, they circled our compound and kept them off of us. And that was my only uh, uh, taste of combat in Vietnam. Since I didn't have an infantry MOS and wasn't in in fact involved with an infantry company. I was part of an infantry brigade, but not as an infantry company. And there at the uh, Ben Son, uh, I was awarded the uh, Bronze Star with a V device and also uh, the Purple Heart for injuries sustained to my hearing. I had a uh, 81 rocket explode right beside of my head, I was in a, a two, fit, two foot thick wall concrete bunker. And this round exploded right beside of my head and it damaged my ear, uh, hearing, so I got a purple heart for that. And anyway, one of the closest calls I had in Vietnam, uh, even though I was there for the Tet Offensive in 1968, uh, one of my closest calls was when I was leaving country and I got to Cameron Bay and was waiting for my plane to pick me up and they told us uh, that we'd have to wait another day because our plane crashed leaving Hawaii that was going to pick us up. So that, that was really my closest call and uh, I'll be here uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask. I, I would 
would appreciate and I'd be glad to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our next panelist is a retired Air National Guard uh, crew member. My name is Scott Johnson. I entered the Air Force in 1971 as a security policeman. I was stationed in Vietnam, Thailand, joined the Guard, and I later on became a loadmaster. Uh, I've served in, uh, I did seven rotations to the desert. I spent six months in Africa and another six months in Bosnia on the ground helping during the Bosnia Tet the Bosnia War. Uh, I've had got over 500 combat missions and uh, a little over 6,000 hours of flying time on 130s. I uh, spent my, in the, on active duty, I was stationed, uh, I went to Vietnam to help close it down and I went to Udorn, Thailand, which was in northern Thailand. And I spent about 15 months overseas there. And, and I'm a local boy too, so. Good afternoon, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Todd Harrell. Um, I joined the military in 1983, uh, at the time it was U.S. Army Reserves. Uh, within about a year and a half, I was given the opportunity to come over and uh, serve under Lieutenant Colonel, then Lieutenant Colonel Tackett, um, and that's what really changed my my life coming over to the, the National Guard and uh, setting, a course, setting a course that would last the next 30 years. Um, I started out initially, I was enlisted, I was uh, basically an E1 through a, a, a buck sergeant before I got my degree. Uh, as Sergeant Major Harry said, uh, I, I, same, same way, I came from a family that quite frankly we didn't have the uh, we didn't have what we needed to, to, to put me through college, so uh, the National Guard uh, stepped up and offered me tuition, and I figured I would just get in for six years and then get out, and here I am 31 years later. Um, having gotten that education through the National Guard, I went on to uh, do several missions within uh, special operation within special forces. Um, I've currently, I've got four tours under my belt. I, deployed to Afghanistan in 2002 and 3, Iraq in 2007 and 8, and then Afghanistan 2009, 10, 11, and 12, uh, coming uh, off orders earlier this year, as a matter of fact. So, um, you know, people say, why, why do you do that? And it goes back to uh, uh, a man in our organization that you're familiar with on this board, uh, Colonel Johnny Young, who every time he would come to me and ask me for something and say, here's your chance to excel, Todd. Everything was couched as a chance, an opportunity to excel, and uh, usually a way to get you to do stuff, but there's a lot to be said there, and I think it's something that uh, everybody out there, uh, you new, new cadets, can think about the opportunities that the military can provide you not just an opportunity to excel, but opportunity to grow. And I've been a very fortunate recipient of, of those opportunities, and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, after a while. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I'll take you back that Whenever I was in high school, uh, I wanted to join the military, and my father insisted that I go to college. And I went one semester of college and failed every subject, and my dad decided that the Army would be the best place for me. <laughs> so I had a cousin that was in the Special Forces here in the state of West Virginia, in the West Virginia National Guard, and he talked me into joining the Special Forces Battalion. I spent nearly six years as an enlisted soldier with a staff sergeant. And had anybody have told me uh, that I would have made the Guard or the, Nat the Army a career, I would have probably punched him in the mouth. Uh, but after starting to serve on an A team and Special Forces and learning the camaraderie and the job of uh, what, what it meant to defend this country and to serve this country, I decided to make the Guard a career and became an officer. Went to Officer's Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, I was a radio operator on an A-team and uh, 
got tired of carrying that heavy radio and jumping out of airplanes with it, so I decided I'll become an officer. Every time I'd go out and make communications, the officer would be laying in a hammock, relaxing, while I would go over two or three mountains to make communications so that uh, you couldn't be detected. And I thought, well, I could do that job a whole lot easier than I, the job I'm doing. So I go to officer's candidate school and I come back and they assign me as the XO on the same A team. Only thing was they hadn't recruited or gotten a radio man. So not only did I have to do the XO responsibilities of the A team, I had to be the radio man again. So I couldn't get away from that radio. But it tendered on, uh, I went through the ranks of special forces, became the battalion commander and then on through the ranks of the West Virginia National Guard and became the Adjutant General. And after September the 11th, 2001, and we started the war in Afghanistan and then in Iraq, at one particular time, every Army unit in the West Virginia National Guard was deployed overseas except for the Army Band. And I took the Army Band to uh, Camp Dawson and taught them how to run engineer equipment because floods are us in West Virginia. <laughs> and sure enough, a month or two passed and we had floods over in Logan County and I had to call the band out to try to take care of the citizens of the state of West Virginia. But that last 10 years of being the adjutant general in those wars was probably the most trying time of my entire military career because to get men and women ready to go in harm's way and fight this nation's battles is probably one of the hardest responsibilities any person can have. And I'm proud to set up here today and say that your West Virginia National Guard succeeded in every mission that they were assigned, both Army and Air, through the entire time since September the 11th, 2001. So I'm glad to be here and we'll entertain any questions that you might have. Uh, and for anybody on the panel, uh, you have a building full of 15 to 18 year old kids trying to figure out what they want to do in life. Uh, if you were in that position again, what, was, what, be, what would be some of the things you do to make, make your decisions better? Uh, things that you'd try to do again or maybe things that you'd work harder at to, so you could be successful when you get older? And anybody can answer that question. Um, actually, I uh, ask that question quite often, and, and I speak to uh, uh, high school age, you know, groups. Um, the biggest challenge I think I had was not knowing what I wanted to be when I grew up, and and having or not knowing what resources were out there. So, uh, what led me to the army was, you know, that uh, stability, uh, getting a, a skill, and you know, a paycheck. Um, but it, 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 it helped me, you know, formulate a plan. Um, but it was uh, always my intention to go to college. And it wasn't until, you know, my, um, you know, halfway through my career in, the, in active duty Army that uh, I realized that what uh, opportunities lie in West Virginia and the National Guard. And that's what I would say is, is to, you know, make an informed decision about your future. Um, college, uh, continuing education, technical schools, absolutely important in today's environment. And if that's your goal and you don't have the means to do it or you don't have a, a clear path to be successful, is ask uh, questions that you can make an educated decision on your future and understand that there's uh, resources out there to where you can come into the Guard, come into active duty, but um, you know, tap into specifically the West Virginia National Guard Education Assistance Program and at no cost to you or your parents, attend college so that you can achieve those uh, goals and, and, and the level of excellence that you see in yourself. So don't, you know, don't limit yourself, ask the questions, get those questions answered and make a very well-developed plan. 
Uh, let me add uh, what was my experience when I graduated uh, from high school and went into the Army. Uh, in the Army, I had uh, an opportunity to apply for the West Point Prep School. Uh, I knew the college wasn't, uh, after graduating, wasn't in my future, but in the Army, this opportunity came up. And I didn't get uh, selected for it because of my high school transcript. So I would say to you that have another year of school, hit the grades. Get your grades up so that if, if an opportunity like that comes along in, in your lifetime, that you'll be better prepared for it. Uh, even though I was asked to go to OCS school uh, three different times in my two years, uh, I felt that uh, the West Point prep was the best course for me because at that time, uh, it was almost guaranteed that if you successfully uh, completed the West Point prep, you'd be accepted into West Point. So that's what I would say. Get your grades up. Hit those books. Thank you. One thing I'd like to add, uh, building on what Sergeant Major Harry said, uh, one of the things I see in a lot of the, the younger soldiers is them you know, waiting for opportunities to come along, whether it's uh, training opportunities or educational benefits, et cetera. Um, There's so many different programs, so many different benefits available to our military personnel, uh, personnel right now. One of the things I would recommend is that if you're fortunate enough to go into the military, make sure you take everything that's offered to you. That's why we have these programs, but a lot of people simply don't seek out these benefits and take advantage of them. Uh, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, what, what about me? Steering your career uh, is, is important and it's going to make you better whether it's in the military or in the civilian world. So take those opportunities, seek out the benefits and certainly steer your career. The military is like uh, an old bottle of 7 Up that used to say, if you like it, it'll like you. <laughs> That's what the military is. If you like it, it'll like you. You've got a lot of opportunities. You get to go a lot of places, do a lot of things you've never done, see a lot of things you've never seen. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for a kid from Fudges Creek that's been to 117 different foreign countries that all I ever did was read about it. The military's got everything in the world for you. But you have to take the opportunity and you have to, to like what you're doing and, and, and know exactly what you want to be doing. You know, life is a learning process. From the day you're born until the day you die, life is an educational process. And it's no matter what you do, you will always be in some kind of educational mode or learning mode all of your life. Now, I was fortunate enough to be able to get the tuition assistance program passed in 1995 by the West Virginia legislature allowing every member of the West Virginia National Guard an opportunity to get a college degree free. Then in uh, 2005 I was lucky enough to get the legislature to pass on to where that we can get through a master's degree. So any young man or woman who joins the West Virginia National Guard has an opportunity for a six-year enlistment to get their college education through a master's degree free. And I can tell you that the key to success in your lifetime is education. You'll never be able to outgrow it, get away from it, but the thing is to do is to challenge it and challenge yourself because the more knowledge you have, the more successful you will be. The military trains you how to be a man or a woman and accept responsibilities. Every school they have is toward leadership and the ability to do a job within the military and be a part of a team. Industry, school, Anything you approach, the same things apply. The more knowledge you have, the more successful you will be. 
Now, I spent an entire life in the West Virginia National Guard, but I only spent that last 15 years as a full-time guardsman. I worked at Hobet Mining and Cedar Coal Company for 23 years of my life. And as I succeeded in the Guard, I became successful in civilian life. I was the mine manager at Hobet 21 Mines, which is here in Lincoln County, over toward the Boone County line. And when I left there to take the adjutant general's job, I took about a $150,000 cut in pay to be the adjutant general because I wanted to be the leader of the West Virginia National Guard. It was part of my lifetime goal to be the adjutant general. But I can tell you I would have never gotten there and I would have never accomplished the goals that I set for myself had I not taken education seriously and gotten the knowledge that it took to be successful in life. So I can tell you there's nothing that takes the place of what you put in this head. I'll leave it to Ted. Any more questions? Yes, sir. First of all, I would like to say thank you for all of you for coming and speaking to us. My question is for the lieutenant colonel on the right. You said that the military helps you grow and excel. What's one example that it has helped you improve? Well, when I came out of high school, I didn't have a, quite honestly a lot of direction. And uh, when I got in the military, it kind of gave me a framework that would actually define the rest of my life. Uh, but one of the things I think that really shaped it, especially in the context is, uh, of us approaching Veterans Day here, was some of my earliest memories were watching soldiers get off the plane from Vietnam. And I remember even at six years old, something struck me at the heart about the service these men performed. And then 30 years later, being on my first tour, it gave me basically a, a pride. It kind of, kind of gave me some definition in my life. You know, everybody, um, you know, looks for ways to affect not just their own life, but the future of their children. And when my daughter brought me into class one day as a veteran, and she came up and hugged me afterward and said, Daddy, I'm really proud of you. And to be able to make that effect, you have that effect on your children's life beyond you know, your, the, the normal parenting, it, it really gives you a great sense of pride. And again, it's a, a set of morals, ethics that you can structure your, your whole life on. Questions for anyone on the panel. Being deployed into combat, how difficult is it to come back home? Exciting. <laughs> it's very exciting to come home. I came home from Vietnam and Thailand and there wasn't any uh, there wasn't any bands playing or anything. The gentleman to my excuse me, to my right here, uh, General Tackett was the last general that was the last person I seen before I got on the airplane. And he was the first gentleman I seen before I got off. Uh, yeah, exciting. Can I can I add something to that? Um, one of the things that, especially for all uh, you Vietnam and and prior veterans out there, one of the things that I've seen on these past few tours is a change in this nation. Um, you know, I hear all the horror stories about how some of our veterans had been treated in the past. I can tell you as a nation, we've grown and we've learned. And I think events like this are indicative of that, that change in our culture. In every tour, I've, again, I've had four tours, and every time I've come back, I've been greeted with open arms by my fellow Americans. And I think that's part of the growing process. So for all of you out there that, that suffered through some of those times, I want to let you know that this nation has learned from that and really stepped up. For you old soldiers, you all, you all, under, you all heard the story that uh, 
a, a soldier's general. I give it to him. <laughs> he is a soldier's general. Um, I have a question for the um, General Tackett. You said that in life you have a lot of lessons that you've learned. What was the most important lesson that you learned throughout your military career? Discipline, being able to control your emotions, and learning to get along with people, and being able to get people to do things uh, through leadership rather than beating them over the head or threatening them with threats that you in turn learn how to lead people and get them to where they want to follow. Uh, I, I think that probably that was uh, what made me successful was the ability to be able to lead and make people want to follow. Uh, My question is for General Tackett. Uh, I'm in the National Guard for the Army, and I was wanting to go to college, and I was thinking about going to college out of state. Is my tuition still paid for? It's in state schools, but I think they have it worked now to where that the federal side will pay uh, for out of state uh, students to go to other schools that you'll still get your tuition and, and your college will be paid for, but it's paid from the federal rather than from the state. If you'd like to get with me after this and we'll, we'll, we'll get you all the options that are available to you. Yes, sir. If, if I could, okay. I don't have a question, but I do have a little statement. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say I appreciate all the military people and their families that was here and everywhere else. And I want to thank my grandson and the other ROTC members here, the young people, that's, but that's uh, preparing herself to lead us in the future. I remember when I was in Vietnam, my mom uh, wrote me one time and she said, said, I try to put myself in your position, you're the situation, and build defenses around you. To build defenses around me because she worried about me. That's what this is, that's what defense is. To defend our country, not just one person, but the whole United States. Every race, religion, political party, everything else. This is to defend us all. And I appreciate, like I said, the people that's in here has done it before, and the people that's, whether they're going to military or not, you know, but to be here for us, to be here, to bring this country forward. That's all I got to say. Let me uh, say, <clears throat> Monday, September the 11th at 11 o'clock. On the 11th month, the 11th hour, the 11th day, we celebrate Veterans Day every year. And it's a time for all of us to pay tribute to those who have sacrificed themselves and put themselves before their own good for the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. I've had the privilege to travel all over the world, Europe, Asia, Africa, South America, Central America, all over the world. And I can tell you without a doubt that you live in the greatest country this world has ever seen. But it didn't come free. There's been dictators and bullies, just like there's bullies in school, there's bullies in other countries who would take away our freedom and our riches if it weren't for these people in this auditorium that put on America's uniform, whether it was in the, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, or the Marines, or the Coast Guard, and defended this country against our enemies. 
By doing that, they have given you the greatest freedom this world has ever seen. Take advantage of that freedom and use it to benefit our nation and our country. You're exactly right. It's all about the United States of America and doing what's right for our country so that our children and our grandchildren can have the same opportunities that we have to be successful and do what we want to do as individuals in this great country that we live in. And I can tell you that everybody that put on that uniform was willing to die to make sure that you have that opportunity to be free. So take advantage of it and do what's right. Thank you. This is a question to Major General Tackett and the two gentlemen beside of you. Were there any adjustments you had to make when getting back into civilian life? Well, yeah, there was, quite a, there was quite a few of adjustments. I was used to paying my bills and everything. My wife had taken that over. Uh, my grandchildren had gotten, and my children had gotten older. And yeah, there's a lot of adjustment when you come back. Uh, you have to find your way again. To, in, with your family and everything. You have to reestablish your, your, with your family. There's quite a bit, yes. You know, we, uh, as a National Guard, when 9-11 came about in 2001, uh, we had one person in our family readiness organization, and uh, I was the chairman of the personnel committee for the Adjutant General's Association of the whole United States. And, you know, when you join the active component, you know, you have an Army base or an Air Force base, and you have all of these uh, facilities to be able to take care of families and to take care of the problems that families have when their loved ones are deployed. But when you start deploying the Guard and the Reserve from the states, there was nothing. Well, today, the West Virginia National Guard has probably 35 to 40 different people that work in family readiness to take care of family issues of those who deploy. So that we have a network and the same uh, programs that an active duty base has to take care of deployed soldiers' families. Uh, and it took a great deal of work and a lot of money uh, from the Army and the Air Force and others to get those facilities set up in all the states because every state was like West Virginia. Uh, the total force concept took place because of the Vietnam War. In Vietnam, active duty people fought the biggest part of that war. The Guard and Reserves played little part in the Vietnam War. And there was no support in the American public for those soldiers coming back from Vietnam. They were spit on, they were cursed, uh, there were demonstrations, and smart people decided that, of the total force concept that our country would never go to war again without taking the National Guard and the Reserve. The people who are in your community, the mailman, uh, the truck drivers, the, uh, the people that work in the coal industry, uh, every walk of life of the people in the Guard and Reserve. So they married these units together so that the active duty couldn't go to war without taking their reserve counterparts in the Guard and the Reserve. But what they didn't do was provide the kind of support mechanisms that are necessary to take care of families once you deploy this force in the Guard and these people go from your neighborhood, then there's really, unless it's just family and people in their neighborhood to take care of them, there's no support mechanism. And we've tried to correct that now because the total force is without a doubt the proper way to go. And the draft is never, in my opinion, the proper way to go because today we have an all-volunteer force. Everybody that's there is there because they volunteered to be there. It's where they want to be, not where they were drafted to be. So their heart and their soul is there and it's their career and it's what they've chosen to do. 
We have by far the greatest military this world has ever seen today because of the total force policy and because of the professional military. You join, you're not forced to join, you're not drafted, you're there because it's what you chose to do. And it's been very successful for this country and for our military. And uh, uh, a lot of lessons learned from Vietnam and put into effect and have been very successful since 9-11. And, and that's why that Todd you see and everybody that's in the military, when you go anywhere in uniform where people come up and thank you for your service, when you activate the guard, you activate America. You activate every community in America. If you send people from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, the only people that know that are the people that's there at Fort Bragg or off post because they don't have all the people there buying from them that. But when you activate the National Guard throughout the United States of America, you activate the American people. And that's why there's so much support for our soldiers today compared to what it was during the Vietnam War. And I'm proud to say that I think our leaders made the right decisions and were in the right direction when it comes to that. But there's a whole lot of effort that has been made to take care of soldiers' families while they're deployed from a National Guard standpoint that wasn't there 9-11. Can, can I share one, one little story on the return, something that I think will stay with me as long as I live. I was. Uh, I was coming and go or, or going, I don't remember which, but I was at the Atlanta airport. I was at the USO station. Um, and I heard this, uh, off in the distance, this clapter breakout, or this clapping breakout, and cheering. And I thought, wow, maybe a movie star had, had is coming through the terminal, maybe a, a football team or something like that. So I walk over to the, the edge of the railing. I look down into the main part of the terminal it was just a group of soldiers that had walked down the stairs and they were heading to their plane to head overseas. And the entire terminal, everybody in that terminal, stood up to cheer their American soldiers. And I've seen that numerous times since then. I'm sure you've seen it, General. I'm sure you've all seen that since 9-11. Um, even in Ireland, I was surprised once at a, in the middle of the night in a terminal in Ireland, people walking up and thanking us for our service. So I think that's absolutely indicative of what you're, you're talking about, sir. One of the, one of the things that uh, I was able to experience about uh, three years ago, for those that don't know, uh, my daughter and my son-in-law are stationed in Fort Knox. While he was getting trained at Marshall, finishing his degree, they were out eating supper one evening and they, they were in uniform. He was in uniform and she was, uh, I think, in PTs or something where they'd been working out. And the, uh, a stranger came out of the blue, thanked him for their service, picked up their bill, and paid it for him, and said, thank you for what you do for us. And I, t and I was just like, wow, things have changed a lot in the last 20 years. And, uh, and I told him, you need to appreciate that and recognize that for what it's worth, because people realize what you're doing and the sacrifice you make for what you do for a living and for our country. At this time, uh, I would like to also, one of the things I had my cadets do was uh, do an essay. They had to find an interview, a veteran in October. They had to write an essay about, do an interview, write an essay about that veteran so they could learn more about what people they know have done in their military careers or find people that they may not recognize as military and figure out what they had done. So what I want to do, and uh, Armstrong has also donated a prizes for the top three winners of this essay. And what I'd like to do is call forward uh, Cadet Blake Smith, Cadet Josh Roberts, and Cadet Robbie Stickler. What they don't know is that they just want some money. Okay? <laughs> so for third place, Blake Smith, you will get a hundred dollar check. The girlfriend is clapping the loudest. <laughs> okay, Josh, $150. And Cadet Stickler, you get a $200 check.
And I've asked uh, Cadet Stickler to share his essay with us. You can go ahead and grab your seat. To better understand the life of a veteran, I sat down with one who is currently serving in the United States Army National Guard and has 16 years of service. In order to help me with this, Master Sergeant Robert J. Stickler provided me with details about his military career, starting out as a combat engineer and switching over to the military police corps. During our time, he explained to me that growing up he didn't have a lot of money and wanted to go to college. So when a recruiter came to talk to him about the military, he told him that the military would pay for his tuition and give him a college fund. At that moment, Master Sergeant Stickler chose to join the military for two years and 17 weeks. This was the shortest amount of time he could serve and still qualify for the college fund. By the end of his first enlistment, he had gotten married and had a child, which gave him the responsibility of providing for his family. Since the military provided him with the means to care for his family, he decided that it would be best to continue his military career. He never expected to stay in as long as he has or reach the level he is currently at. For this reason, he hasn't regretted his decision of joining the military. He explained to me that he has been deployed overseas seven times, two times to Kuwait, once to Bosnia, Egypt, Romania, Iraq, and Af Afghanistan. He told me that the hardest part of his military career is when he has to leave his family. He shared with me that in his opinion, in order to have a successful military career, you have to be proactive, you must perform your best at everything you do, and be willing to make sacrifices. Always dedicate yourself in furthering your education and knowledge of your job by attending not only your required schools, but any others that you can make, that can make you a better leader. He further explained to me that if, you could, if he could go back to the day he picked his military job, he would choose a different MOS. He would want to choose one that would prepare him for life once he left the military and would like doing the most. He told me that the military can prepare you for a job outside the service by teaching you discipline and a strong sense of responsibility. Many of the military jobs coincide with civilian occupations giving you an upper hand when transitioning to a civilian life. In conclusion of the interview, Master Sergeant Robert J. Stickler provided the following advice for future servicemen and women. No matter what motivated you to join the military, always give 110% in all that you do. Live up to your military branch's values and continually seek ways to improve your mind and strengthen your body. You must be willing to make necessary sacrifices and most of all, take care of your family, yourself, and those who are around you. That's it. At this time, I would request that the band uh, would play their service songs. Following the service songs, we have a cadet and band member that will be playing taps.
Following the playing of tasks by Cadet Timmy Atkins, uh, please join us in the Commons area for refreshments. And again, thank you for coming. And again, this is to honor those that have went before us. Thank you gentlemen for sharing your stories with us and please join us and the, the veterans in the commons area and thank you for attending the ceremony.